afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are back with another neurodiversity story and I'm your host. My name's Darren Clark. Thank you so much, everyone who has been uh, a previous guest on our neurodiversity stories. And uh, and we have another incredible guest today. We have a good, a good friend of mine, Aaron Swan, who's going to be sharing his story around dyslexia, workplace, uh, school life, and again, kind of how dyslexia has uh, affected him. As always, guys, we can't do this without you. So if you could let us know where you're tuning in from, uh, a little bit about yourself, feel free to, to share uh, how neurodiversity affects you uh, or benefits you in, in any way, shape or form. So it's always great to hear from uh, from all of our guests uh, and, and all of the, the people that are viewing uh, the show as well. Like I said, we, we've had an incredible array of guests on there. We're always looking for more guests. Uh, if you would like to, uh, to come on to neurodiversity stories and share your story, then please do. Guys, I also want to say a massive uh, thank you to our sponsor who's been sponsoring uh, our, our show for the quite uh, the past kind of five uh, episodes, and that's Touch, Type, Read, and Spell. And guys, I want to share with you uh, a little bit about them. When you begin learning to type with TTRS, you'll have the opportunity to customize every aspect of the learning process. With just a few clicks, you can set your keyboard, audio, typeface, and display contrasts, add an avatar, and fill in basic profile information. Select your typing preferences and set benchmarks depending on your goals. For example, get extra help with spelling using settings like remember and repeat, or support sight reading with copy typing. The TTRS course takes learners through a series of 24 levels. Each level contains 31 modules that offer just the right amount of challenge. Results are easy to track and progress is displayed in customizable charts and weekly reports. That's how easy it is to learn with touch type, read and spell. So guys, touch, type, read and spell. All their details will be in uh, in the bio, in the blurb. Uh, if you're listening to this on podcast or watching this on YouTube or watching this live, then you will be able to see uh, all the details. So guys, who am I and why am I putting on neurodiversity stories? So like I've mentioned, my name is Darren Clark and I'm a global neurodiversity consultant and I work with global organizations uh, across the globe, <laughs> hence in the, in the word, raising more awareness around neurodiversity in the workplace by teaching, training and speaking. As I mentioned today, guys, if you could let us know where you're tuning in from, uh, that would be absolutely fantastic. We do have people from Poland, from France, from America, from Kenya, uh, and we're always getting people watching these on replay. So if you are watching the replay, feel free to drop a, a question or a comment underneath. We do love uh, to hear from you. We have another incredible guest with uh, with you today, guys. As I mentioned, Aaron Swan, uh, who is going to be sharing his story around dyslexia. And I hope that you can sit back, grab a coffee uh, as we welcome Aaron. Good morning, Aaron. How are you, my friend? Good, good. How are you getting on? Yeah, very well, sir. Very well, very well indeed. All the button pushing and everything else is all kind of coming together, so we're all good. How, how's your morning been so far, Aaron? Good, good. Busy, but good. <laughs> busy, but good. So, Aaron, I, I really do appreciate, uh, I know you're an incredibly busy man, and I really do appreciate you taking the time out uh, to come on to Neurodiversity Stories and, and share it, kind of, you know, your thoughts, your story, your journey. That would be um, amazing. So, I've been following you. I think we connected on LinkedIn uh, quite some time ago. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I remember reading one of uh, your blogs around dyslexia, which we will come on to if, that, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I know, I know uh, a Quite a bit, uh, quite a bit about you uh, in that way. But it'd be amazing if you could tell the the listeners a little bit about yourself. That would that'd be amazing. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think we we met. I, I um, started a business. or oh, I think it was almost a year ago. Um, after getting made redundant, well, through COVID and all these kind of things. And I think at that point, I sort of really started paying attention to LinkedIn. And um, that was when I started. Uh, I saw a lot of data and stuff, and um, reached out with some had some good conversations. But um, yeah, so since since then, the business is firmly on the back burner, and I now run the manufacturing um, and service and 
everything else that needs to do with building uh, robots at a company called Leap Automation, uh, which is brilliant. It's a really a, a sort of dream job. I love it. But uh, no, it's it's great. It's amazing what you can fall into when uh, when you sort of least expect it. I had uh, my my background from from leaving school. I left school in uh, into f- fifth year. It's always been sixteen, seventeen. Did an apprenticeship in oil and gas, and I went through that. Uh, the apprenticeship at a smaller company and then went to one of these big service companies and it was great and did loads of different jobs. So no, I'll, I'll talk us through um, yeah. some of that so, so as we go. But no, it's it's been it's been a journey. But I think what, what the the blogs taught me, I, I started to blog um, originally to drive traffic to the Neotech website. Yes. And, um, and it was great. And then I, I had some stuff on topics. The, the business was around uh, fault-finding engineering problems, which is one of the things that is absolutely my skill set which i attribute to being dyslexic as well but um i found that the more personal the blogs got the more interest they drove and then uh, my wife said you know you, you should you should tell them that you're dyslexic and i was like oh no nobody cares about that um and i did and um i think oh that that one got i think i was i was getting maybe two or three uh, hundred views on doing these blogs that one got like five thousand or something um it went everywhere absolutely everywhere and uh, off the back of it i got I won the last line that was said something to the effect of if anybody ever has any questions or anything I can help them with, you know, sort of lifetime survivor of dyslexia. It's like I'll leave, uh, I'd love to help. And um I actually got loads and loads of people contact me. And um, so there was a few great ones. I won't all mention any names because you're just not not for no, me to say, but yeah. But the um there was a there was a mum in uh, South Africa who'd uh, just found out her son was dyslexic. Um and it, you, the way she started talking about it, it was like it was the world it was over. You know what we're we gonna do, yeah. and I was like, no, no, like no, don't don't look at it like that. Look at it as a there's lots of different things. You know, you got to look at dyslexia as an advantage. What you know, we might not be good at book reports, but they'll be good at loads of other stuff. So I think it, there's still still this crazy perception of dyslexia, and loads of I'm sure loads of other neurodiversity stuff that um, it can be a massive uh, uh, learning. Well, when I was at school, it was a learning difficulty. You had a learning difficulty. You didn't have just like yeah. yeah. We, we'll, we'll go on because yeah. I, I know when we spoke before, it kind of school days. You know, I can kind of relate. Uh, mm. You know, to kind of how how tricky I, I use the terminology quite loosely. Tricky uh, yeah. uh, school was um, obviously mm-hmm. very kind of um, so so. So we'll come on to that if that's okay. I, I yeah, noticed, Karen, when when you um you know you you opened up and you shared that kind of personal blog so to speak in the sense mm-hmm. of you know uh, you know being sharing with dyslexia it's I, I noticed when I started sharing my kind of journey in and dyslexia uh, those side of it it is it, it helps so many people and it helps mm-hmm. so many, the thing is it helps so many people and that you don't know because the, the people that reach out to you and say you know thank you for sharing this uh you know I can relate to this my son my daughter my husband I'm going through this and and those are you know really humbling to get those kind of messages but it's it's also as well that the fantastic the amount of people that you don't know about uh that, yeah. that can read this and then start making small incremental train changes or going into their workplaces but it would have made i remember feeling a little bit kind of vulnerable when i when i shared this because you are it's quite a uh, did you feel that aaron in, the, in some, some aspects that you felt well, yeah, kind of opening it's myself a, up. yeah it's quite a personal thing and i think um I see, um, well, my my mum as a kid was sort of my biggest champion so she filled me with confidence you know dyslexic but did you know Leonardo da Vinci was dyslexic and you know the, these kind of things so you know Richard Branson's dyslexic and all these kind of things so I mean I had that drummed into me from I think I was five or six um, so I've always been pretty confident about the fact I've never hidden the fact I'm dyslexic I've never broadcast it which is why the blog was different but I've never if, if asked or if conversation I was like oh yeah I'm dyslexic I've never I've never shied away from, it, and I know lots do. Yeah. Um, but I think that's bad as well because then nobody knows what's going on. But yeah, I've never, I never broadcast it. So did I sit down and write a blog? Been like, I think there's, I can't remember the title. There, there, there's a, the the blog pretty much went on. There was a, a great uh, a story from uh, Made by Dyslexia, which are the yeah. brilliant, brilliant uh, company. Incredible. I think you're involved with them as well, aren't you? Okay, well, yeah. look, um, not involved with them personally, but I, I do. Yeah, I know Kate Griggs, and she's yeah, yeah, she's she's, 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 she's brilliant. So she yeah. had a, a brilliant uh, statistic about um, millionaire dyslexics, and uh, I think uh, statistically speaking, the mo- uh, self-made billionaires, forty percent of them are dyslexic or something. So the, I, I pretty much wrote the blog along the lines of 
I'm way more likely to be a billionaire than you are. You know, <laughs> and that's and I think <laughs> they, um, yeah, yeah, you got to um, you got to be proud of what, what you've got. But I think the um, yeah, the mentality of, of it is changing. But I think yeah. the problem is as you get um, grown ups or people who've, who've managed to be confident enough uh, as they go through are okay. I I'm most worried about sir. These people still coming through, so or just finding they're dyslexic when they're grown ups or when they're a teenager, and that's tough. It's tough it to realize that you're you're different, and I think that's the point is that you are different, you know. Absolutely, yeah. and I think you know. I guess it, it depends on where you are. So if you think career wise, uh, mm -hmm. you, you know, you think to yourself, it, we're always kind of you know within a job anyway. If we're working for a company, it, you have that position where you think you know you, you, you're you know you're marked on your performance, uh, and you need to deliver the role that you're employed for. And obviously, mm -hmm. there's you know there's niceties and everything around it. I'm not saying it's just you know a dictatorial kind of uh, a way, but yeah. that that nervousness of then going in, it, especially if a company isn't, uh, I guess. Um, set up at this point in time to you know to assist and help and understand a little bit more about dyslexia that's what uh, you know some of the companies i found when we've spoken to them uh it, you know they want to kind of help their employees but sometimes when you raise your hand and you say i've got to say got dyslexia it's mm -hmm. the, the onus is then put back on the individual and said okay so what support do you need and yeah. it depends if you're on that journey of only just self-discovery around dyslexia sometimes you don't know uh, yeah. what you know what you need I, I i don't always know what tools i need and and you yeah. know i've been diagnosed for, you know for quite some time yeah i think it's 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 amazing i think the problem is as well that it's not an all-size-fits-all it's not you can say well here's your dyslexic help package this will make, <laughs> and this will this will make this dyslexic employee yeah as, as you know spelling competent as as everybody else or whatever that you know that specific person's yeah, uh, struggles are you know it's, it's all it's all totally different. So the um so I'll maybe talk about the school bit. So when I when I was um I've got I've got three brothers. So I've got two older brothers and one younger brother, and um so my my mum is fiercely protective and uh, always looked after us. So we <laughs> remember when I was at school, and I came home. And I think I was about primary one, and uh, my mum and mum and dad had always thought there was going to be something a little bit different because I didn't learn to cycle as early as my brothers did and all that kind of thing. And I think they had uh, this, this idea in the back of their head that there was maybe something, um, only because they've had a direct comparison to two older brothers. Um, and I came home apparently one day and said, mom, I think I'm different from the other kids. And my mom uh, was horrified by this. So back <laughs> straight into school, apparently like the next day, you know, I took the afternoon off work and came into school. Goes, uh, you need to work out what's going on here. There's no way my son's going to feel like he's uh, different from everybody else. That's not fair. So, um, we were told that you can't you can't diagnose dyslexia this young. You know, that's not how it works because that would have been early nineties. Um, and they were like, "Oh no, oh well, they can do tests, but they, they don't really know." What age were you around, around that? Was it kind of nine? Uh, I mean, I've been five or six. Five is wow. Okay. So, yeah. so you're still you're still learning to read and write. So they're like, "Oh well, you can't really do any of the tests." And and mum's like, "Yeah, but you know, two older brothers, same household, same upbringing. You'd imagine roughly same intelligence level. You know, my, they were picking up quicker than this. So what's going on?" You know, all yeah. kids are different, but you know, my mum being my mum, uh, pushed him. Was like, no, I want him. I want uh, the uh, educational psychologist because that's who. I don't know if it's still how they do it, but that's who comes into schools in Scotland anyway and does the tests. And um, I can't remember the man's name. Old guy, big beard. Um, vividly remember what's going on, and I remember I spent like a day with him doing all these these different tests. And I, I vividly remember the meeting at the end of the day. And he goes, well, I can conclusively say your son is really quite dyslexic. And um, the teachers are horrified. He goes, oh, oh, right, okay. It's just, oh, I, we thought you couldn't tell. And he was like, oh, well, it depends how severe the dyslexia is. But there's this, oh, he was really, he's really quite dyslexic. And I vividly remember that saying, really quite dyslexic. So not just yeah, a little it's dyslexic. Say, it's, quite a terminology that you're not, <laughs> it's not, you're dyslexic, it's just really, yeah, you're really. Just like, you're like almost surprised about how dyslexic your child is. Wow. And uh, you know you laugh about it now, but at the time I was like, I have no oh, idea with them. I get it, you know, yeah. Like, and the um, and again, I don't know whether or not the things have come on now from school, but the stuff I tried at school, it was awful. You know, if you didn't feel different enough, the the stuff that you got given. At one point, I actually had rose tinted glasses, actual glasses that had tints in them, because they decided that was to help. I think back then there was an awful lot of suck it and see, um, yeah. and I had a, I had a green overlay, which actually I think did help at some point. Um, but again, because not every everybody's different. It's you know it might work for one kid and not work for another kid, but the one I vividly remember is that uh, I had this big wooden board thing that uh, like ratcheted up and it sat like that on your desk. But I mean it must have been like just bigger than an A3 sheet of paper because somebody somewhere decided I was so I was dyspraxic as well as dyslexic. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So like, um, like my handwriting is still absolutely horrendous. And like, I didn't learn to cycle a bike till I was like maybe eight or nine. Cause I used to just push in the pedals at the same, same uh, um, pressure. Yeah, yeah, so you, yeah, yeah. you go on the pedals and you just push the same and just sort of fall over. Yeah. Um, so they decided that handwriting wise, this big board thing would help. Um, but I mean, you know, imagine a kid's primary school. It took up my entire space. It was huge. And you walk in the class. And this was, this, this was with all your other the class friends. It wasn't in the same Yeah, yeah. No, no, you're yeah, so still in the same class. Mm-hmm. It was just massive, absolutely massive. And to be fair, my primary school teachers were great. Um, yeah. But yeah, I remember I, I go off. So there's a, there's a couple of years and you're sort of feeling super isolated because you're, um, you know, you're, you're literally being singled out as super different and especially as well because i was so young i don't think the school knew how to deal with it because i think they had dyslexics that were maybe at the top end of school you know primary six primary seven yeah it's a bit more normal for them to have worked it out but um i remember my two my i say what the three brothers my two older brothers are always like we were always spending loads of time together always socializing and i remember them um, properly having this decision is like you know you can either sort of go totally introvert and you know, keep to yourself, um, or go full the other way. So um, I did that. <laughs> um, hard to believe, I know. But the end. <laughs> so I I went sort of full extrovert, and yeah. um, but I, I I do remember it being. I mean, it must have been I don't know eight or nine, and really thinking about it. It's one of the sort of earliest grown up memories. I sort of like serious decisions uh, so i made sure i went to every it's like i used to not want to go to friends houses to play because i didn't want to go because what if they're doing something that i can't do um so like but then at that point i was like no i'll go i'll go everything i remember invited to i'll go I'll, I'll do everything and then you know and yeah it was great i had great friends at school primary school second school was great the time i got to secondary school i was so confident in the fact that i was dyslexic it was almost matter of fact i was like yeah i'm dyslexic that's fine yeah sort of out my way um but i mean secondary school at the time it is it's it's I feel bad because there's obviously thousands of people who try really hard to help dyslexics. You know, there's this, this huge huge support, yeah. but I think what isn't looked at is the social aspect. So that you get you get extra time in exams, but you get extra time in exams, and it's a pure logistics thing. You either go in first or you stay back late, and you are right at the back of the exam hall, so you don't interrupt people coming in or late in or back. So you like come in, and there was like four or five of us at the back of this exam hall, and you were there for longer. So not only are you spending more time in the exam which is great gives you more time to read the questions and i absolutely appreciate it um but now everybody in your entire year knows that you're dyslexic you know so it's like not that it's anything to be ashamed of no but it just it, puts more pressure on a 13 14 15 year old um or more awareness onto it and i think um I, i've mentioned it in my blog i think if you can come out of school with your sort of self-confidence intact and if you sort of learn to develop your own cheats or hacks to how to get through certain things um, you, you'll do you'll do really well. You know, in the in the workplace, there's the the, the world is is becoming more and more uh, suited to dyslexic. You know, with new tech uh, new technologies and everything, we're built for it. We're built for uh, fault finding and engineering wise, tech wise especially. We're we're just wired that way. I, so I think it's great. And, and it'd be great to, to touch on that because I, I speak to a lot of kind of uh, engineers uh, mm-hmm. that, that kind of talk about, you know, a lot of people are dyslexic and engineers and they kind of gravitated in, into that kind of field. I just want to touch on um, you, well, you mentioned about the um, the exams uh, and the extra time. And I've mentioned this on, on the, the, the university stories a few times and uh, in blogs and conversations. What's your, your take on that? Because I, I feel you know i wasn't um put through any exams in school because they just didn't feel that you know their terminology their, their actual phrases was it would just be a waste of paper which i looking back on it was just uh, horrific. you couldn't uh, say that now could you no you, you couldn't and you shouldn't uh, i shouldn't have said it back then no. but, you shouldn't. But, no. but but generally when if you if you're say you know uh, dyslexic and you're going into an environment of of a test uh you know i'm dyslexic adhd so sitting down mm-hmm. for a long period time and stress and the anxiety that would come into uh, as a child going into an exam hall knowing that you're going to be singled out in the sense of sitting at the back knowing that you're going to be uh, there before so everyone's walking in or walking out those those elements so to the i i think personally the 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 more time given and this is again just purely my my views on this more time given mm. only enhances the stress and the strain of the child within that environment because if yeah. you say we're going to be sitting here for an hour now you're going to be sitting there for an hour and a half mm. and you're going to be three minutes into the test words be moving around feeling anxious yeah. not being able to do it and that that period of time i can see it works for some people for me i guess yeah. it would 
But yeah, it's yeah. interesting. So I think, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it totally depends on the person. Um, and I, th I think, I think in reality, there's probably better ways they could help. So the whole, the way it's explained to me, the whole point of the extra time is that you need longer to read the question to understand it. Yeah. I was like, well, why can't I have a dictaphone? Or why can't I have a, a, these days anyway, an MP3 player and I hit go on question one and it reads it out to me and then I'll write my answer. You know, like, the, it's probably not so easy back then, but surely you can do that kind of thing now. Or, you know, the, the, the pens that read out the, the text, why don't, why don't they have these, this, this sort of thing? Because then you don't need it, maybe an extra five minutes. You know, you shouldn't need that much more. Okay. And the, so I, I can understand the, the principles of it, but yeah, again, it's, it's, it's totally, it's totally different dyslexics to dyslexics. They all, they all change. I remember um, when I was at school, you could, you could, I, I I didn't know who and who was dyslexic until I sat my standard grades, which would be in like fourth year, and then you get to the back of the back of the exam hall and you see everybody and go, oh, these all these people are dyslexic, yeah. and you could cut them in half. There was the people that well, actually not half. There's different. There was there was factions that were embarrassed and didn't want to tell anybody, and this they were like super ashamed. They were out the back of the back of the room. There was a few of us who were like, I don't care. That's fine. You know, I can rock it. That's fine. And then there was a, the smaller percentage who I think um, had just given up. They were like, oh yeah, school's not for me. But the problem with that is, you know, I, I did okay at school. I didn't do spectacularly, but I did okay. But I mean, it just knocks on everywhere. If you, these these people believe that if if the school system beats them down to the level where they believe that they're not good enough to do this kind of thing, which means they're not good enough in comparatively to their peers, that has a knock on effect for life in yeah. in everything, workplace or they won't apply for a job that they could maybe do because they don't think they're good enough, and that Absolutely. kind of thing. And I think I think that's terrible. And I think the, the there needs to be a lot more focus on that that element of it of the of inclusion of of everything i don't know oh, they were they were never singled out and i appreciate whether that sort of thing was to help but there must be better ways yeah, yeah. And, and, and i think aaron you know listening to your story you know it sounded like you had you know an incredible support network but at home uh, yeah, which, which really you know with, without fail goes uh, you know would be incredible because you know that support network that you had at home in, enhanced that when you went into the schools that confidence that you built and then you carried that confidence uh you know i'm not saying that it wasn't a struggle that's not what i'm oh, no, saying of course but, so. but sometimes when you have that that kind of belief that, that these people behind you mm -hmm. uh and that mindset because going into secondary school would have been daunting because but then mm -hmm. you opened up about dyslexia if, if you know you i think about when i went to school still undiagnosed with dyslexia but just knew that the last year of primary school was tough and this was going to be really tough because it was a lot of mm. exams and a lot of tests and it, yeah absolutely. It's kind of with your peers in in things mm -hmm. so, so I, I believe the support network is, is key. i think it's crucial it's absolutely crucial but you know, we'll talk back to the, the engineering stuff you know the um I've, I've worked with loads of loads of engineers so, so I, yeah so i i left school and did an, did an apprenticeship a little a, a small company uh doing some oil and gas stuff um it was great and then i went to a big company um called acker solutions massive uh subsea oil service firm uh, thousands of, oh, i don't know fifty thousand across the world huge um and in, yeah. in aberdeen where i'm from and uh, i had loads lots of different jobs um within them it was great and they, they encouraged me to progress and i i think there's a lot to be said about playing to your strengths um, so yeah, I was I was a technician, and then I was promoted from a technician to a, like a support engineer role, because I found myself on the workshop floor doing a lot of fault finding. Something goes wrong with these big subsea oil and gas bits of equipment. I, I really enjoyed taking it apart and working on what happened and why it happened and all that kind of thing. Um, and then moving to the support uh, team, so I was I was an engineer. So I went from a technician to becoming an engineer, which was great. Um, you know, with no formal qualifications because I just had at that point I would have had I don't know seven or eight years experience on the tools yeah. um and it was interesting because the that support team was really good but they were split in half you could tell the people who were proper book learned engineers and guys who climbed up from the shop floor and they had two completely different skill sets and what you find laterally is that um an awful lot of guys on the shop floor were either undiagnosed dyslexic because there's a guy i worked with i said you should get checked and he was like, no, no, no. And he goes, no, I think you're dyslexic. I can spot them like a mile off. I was like, no, no, you could definitely. <laughs> I <think> radar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got dyslexic radar. And he did. He got checked. You I found, found out at like 35 that he was dyslexic. And he was like, this makes so much sense. He was like, yeah. So these guys, who were some of the best engineers I've ever worked with, um, didn't, didn't go to uni because they didn't want to go to uni because they didn't think they'd be able to hack it. But they went the, the different route. They went the apprenticeship route, which I think should be encouraged so hard because it's so much more i think especially hands-on jobs it's a it's so much easier to progress and by the time you're far enough up the tree if you progress that way 
that you think dyslexic might be an issue, you have an, a good enough understanding that it's not a big deal. So I mean, I, I, I wrote big procedures and I cheat, that's how I did it. You know, I, I, I write notes. If I'm reading anything, I absolutely anything, I've got a highlighter and a notebook, anything that I need to care about. I highlight the stuff that I know is important and then I'll scribble all over it. I often score out like faff words, if that makes sense. If there's a big long sentence and I know that I want to come back to a few bits. I just scribble out the bits I don't yeah. care about. So when you scan yeah. that through it, you don't scan the whole page. You're only scanning the bits that you know. And yeah. you know, maybe 20% of it will go in. The second time I go through it, it makes a lot more sense. And then I take notes on it. And you know, you, everyone has their own strategies. By the time you get to the stage that you need these things, you've already got your strategies. So I mean, I've, I've, I've written massive procedures that you never thought came from a dyslexic. I mean, these big organizations, they all go through um, technical assistance. You review them all. Most most engineers' spelling and grammar is horrendous, so they don't, they don't even ask. They're like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> they fix all these things. Um, but I think, as you say, it really does depend on the business and I think what you've chosen to go into. Yes. I think um, I was always driven towards, my dad's a builder. Okay. Um, and from a really young age, I was taking stuff apart. Mum um, tells a story, I got a transformer for my birthday and I took it apart. I took all the little screws out. And yeah, I got, yeah. got in like really big trouble because I took this whole thing apart. And I was like, oh, no, it's okay. I'll fix it. And they went, oh, yeah, okay. And uh, and I did. I put the whole thing back together. When I, yeah. I was like, All right. I, I took a, my, my parents bought um, this this uh, kind of, it was like the stack system of, of radio, uh, you know, like a yeah. hi fi kind of thing. And yeah, I remember yeah. it was, um, that they purchased it and it was quite a you know a bit of money back then. I remember mm -hmm. thinking, oh, I, you know, what's inside? Because I'm always inquisitive about things. So I, I, <laughs> How does that I'm, work? Not, yeah. I'm not an engineer, but I started taking it apart, looking at all the boards and everything else. And I was thinking, this is amazing. And mm. I just remember my dad coming in, looking at it, thinking, oh, you know, what are you doing? I said, don't worry, I can put it back. It didn't yeah. work again. But <laughs> but I learned so much not to, not to take yeah. things apart with that. But in seriousness, I, I, I love that inquisitiveness of asking a question mm. and, and finding out how something works. You know, how does a, you know, because... You look at the computer, that's the screen, that's what you want to do. But behind it is all the mechanics and everything else that, that, that makes it run. It's just so interesting. Sorry, I just absolutely. wanted to share that. <laughs> oh, no, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. I think I think it's crucial. And so I've, I ended up, um, it's actually, I was, I was I made redundant from acquisition of your COVID, no world melted. That was fine. And um, I was actually a, a guy I used to work with. He, um, he was working at the company I'm at now and he goes oh Alan you should, you should come and have a chat with them because they were um they were working on something at the time so oh, maybe you could come help sort of under my business you could just come and help them with something so I came in for a couple of weeks contract and at the end of the contract I goes oh do you want to um come on board and run our manufacturing department for building these robots and I was like I don't, I don't know anything about robots and they went oh, okay and he's just like, oh, yeah. he's like, he's like yeah. and they just showed me loads of drawings and they showed me their prototype ones and I was like yeah that makes sense I could build that yeah, that sounds good. Wow. So uh, I'm six six months on, and uh, yeah, it's great. It's really good. I've built loads of robots now, and it's um, I'm uh, I get teams starting to grow, and it's it's brilliant. I think the um one bit again, so I don't know if it's, if it's really dyslexic related or if it's it's probably good advice for anybody, is the whole um networking piece. If you I hate the term networking because I think it's really feels really sleazy businessman, but um actually having good conversations with people will help so much in everything. And I think that was probably one of my sort of coping techniques as a dyslexic. If you, um, like I knew the TAs really well. So I used to give them a heads up and I was like, I've got a big procedure coming. Let me know if uh, not, something doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, I'll buy you a coffee. <laughs> and they all laugh and joke and it was fine. Um, but I mean, that helped. I, I mean, I could, I had no guilt about sending these procedures off to the TAs to review them, who sorted all the, my awful grammar and that kind of thing. And it was, it was great because you, you you build a relationship with people. And I think that all ties back to not having, if, you, if your confidence has been knocked so severely earlier on, you won't do that. And then it becomes this like snowball of everything it's, being harder, you know? Yeah. It's because it's something else that you feel inadequate that in your head. You think, well, actually, if I can't do this, this and this, and then I can't do this, they may think that if I ask them for help for this, they may think this. So so it is a lot of it is that confidence element. And yeah. I completely understand where it stemmed from and how mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, absolutely. that, you know, that, that come from it. And, and I guess, you know, how does your kind of working day work? I mean, are there periods where you feel, I mean, you're very kind of, you know, you're in an industry that you love uh, and you're doing mm -hmm. something that you love doing, which is, you know, the secrets of life, basically, yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the secrets of life in, in, you know, you enjoy something that that you do. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I guess, you know, for me, if I'm working on something, I, I love doing what I do, but if I'm working on something that I'm, you know, that I find draining, that will literally take my kind of energy and, and kind of mindset away. Are there yeah. any kind of uh, tools or tricks that you do uh, that kind of yeah, help absolutely. you get through some of the stuff that you probably find a little bit more trickier? Yeah, absolutely. So I I, um, I block my day out. I, I have done for years. So I... I come in and I get a coffee and I come in quite early. I, I have done for a long time. And I think it's because I feel like I need a bit more time to get through my emails and stuff. So I come in and have a coffee and I go through all the emails that I probably haven't looked at since lunchtime the day before. Because my theory has always been, if it's that big a deal, they'll phone you or they'll come and find you. So <laughs> so I've got, because I've got to do so much stuff on the tools and uh, it's still in the workshops. Yeah, I just, yeah. yeah, I don't really look at much emails after sort of maybe one, two o'clock. But yeah, I'll go through my emails, make sure all, all that's dealt with. But that, that can take a while. And I take any, any again, I've, I've always got a notebook. I take notes on what's anything that needs needs to be done, um, which helps massively. And then I, I've always been a huge believer as you sort of, if you're doing something, you should be hundred percent focused on it. And that, that alone helps so much. Um, if you can, you know, if you're, you're building a robot or building a computer or writing an email, all you should be focused on is doing that. And if you can do that, which is so much easier to say than it is to actually do because yeah. you're doing it. And then you're thinking about, oh, well, after this, I've got to do this, this, and this, and it's like, ignore that, do this bit and do it really well. And you probably only have to do it once. Yeah. And then when it's gone, it's gone. And I think that makes a big difference. Finally, I also took on um, oh, well, probably about a year ago. No, actually, that's not true. Six months ago. was um, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, bullet journaling. Have you ever come across that? There's, yeah. a, there's a whole world of bullet journaling. I and think um, yeah. yeah, it gets called Bujo and stuff. There's there's a big like Instagram thing, and people make them look really, really pretty. But I actually listen to a lot of uh, audiobooks. Yes. Um, I, I barely read, which is terrible, but you know, understandable. But I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Amazing. And um, I listen to um, the one by the guy who sort of invented bullet journaling, a guy called Ryder Carroll. Uh, and his book's really good. And one of the main things he says is it doesn't need to be pretty. It needs to work for you. And the entire purpose of this book is it's a to-do list, but really well-structured. So if you, a problem with to-do list is people start a to-do list and they scratch off two or three things and then they need to take some notes and then the to-do list is lost halfway in the notebook and it's gone forever. So the entire purpose of a, as a, of a Bujo is you start at the, the beginning of the day. So after my emails, I sit on my um, Bujo and I write down the stuff that I need to get done that day. Okay. And at the end of the day, you have another self-review and you uh, tick off all the stuff you've done. If you haven't done it that day, you migrate it, which is the term, and you push it on to the next day. If it is no longer a problem, you put a line through it, and you don't need to care about it. And or if it needs to go out a few months, you can push it out into what they call a future log. There's loads of there's a whole world to it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's actually really, really good. And I think what's the problem some people that spend loads and loads and loads of time on it and they get stickers and do big drawings and stuff, but mine looks like hen scratchings. Um, but it works, works for me. And I think it's really good at focusing your thoughts. And yeah. if you can go through your, your working day and go or your you know, study day or whatever you're doing and actually focus on what you've got on your list. And when you're on that one, you're on that one and you get it done. And I think that, that makes a huge difference. Oh, that, that, Absolutely. that would make, I mean, the, you know, there's so many distractions, you know, we talk the, you know, the mobile device, you know, the, yeah. you know when I'm working on the, uh, you know, my computer, I, I just get kind of like a bean come through or this, and mm. there's always something uh, that can kind of distract uh, you or, you know, where you're working and stuff. But, but, but those, yeah, those, those kind of tips, those kind of things that you work on, I, I generally, yeah. you know, I've shared this, I generally, um, I, I, truly believe that if you're, you're working on a task focus on that task you know fully mm-hmm. and try and get your you know oh, almost it's huge involved, you know get kind of all in with that task i tend to you know put my headphones in and listen to a lot of classical music that kind of helps me kind of uh you know zone out but it's funny mm-hmm. I, i've mentioned this before my the classical music i will listen to two types i will listen one where it's just instruments when i'm kind of working i'm trying to get involved and then mm-hmm. to relax i then listen to kind of the you know when they got the vocals so okay. it's, it's kind of understanding the two uh, so but that for, for some reason that really kind of helps me um you know kind yeah. of and, and when i i do that i just know there's some people that listen to kind of um uh this kind of like a, a ticking clock or something or yeah. something tick, tick, or, tick. i mean that would just, just in any, <laughs> any instrumental music yeah absolutely i think uh, i think there's there's a lot to be said for that but just if you can sort of zone out especially if you're in busy offices and stuff like that I think it's probably even more, it helps everybody, but I think it's probably even more um, relevant to dyslexics. 
because um, it's so easy to get scared. And I think that's probably part of the whole thing as well. I don't know if you've ever uh, read or heard of uh, Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen it. I've, I've yet to read. I've literally, wait, funny you should say that. I've actually downloaded that uh, a week ago uh, onto, yeah. my, uh, onto my Audible. Um, oh, it's brilliant. It's, but, yeah, it's, it's massive. I think it's like 17 hours long or something. But that's really good. <laughs> it, goes, it goes through, um, if you go all the way through it, you get one of those, there's, you know, the awards you get in Audible. So it says like uh, long timer or something. It's huge. <laughs> so, um, I've listened to it twice. It's really interesting. So they go through loads and loads of different people from all, all different walks of life, you know, sports and business okay. and all those kind of things. And they, the whole premise is it's, it's all off the back of Tim Ferriss's podcast, which is really good. You know, he's listened to that one either. And, um, but it goes through what these people do. And I've, uh, I've I've spoken to my wife about this for ages. That when I get five minutes, I would love to actually um, either start a sort of podcast type thing or effectively write a dyslexic tools of titans and get you know interview people about you know, what what do they do because everyone's so different. It'd be interesting just to get you know you get yeah, get, yeah. You know, a hundred of the most the, the the sort of most well known dyslexics and some people in between and just find out what 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 are their coping mechanisms because they obviously work. You know your Alan Sugars and. Richard Branson's and all these kind of people. I'd love to, you know, have a sit down chat with all these people and figure out how do they get through the day. How do they make sure that you know what they're sending out in an email is actually readable from <laughs> for normal people. Yeah, you know, I, I think I, that'd be great. I, yeah, think, just... I think Aaron, I think you, you know, you've documented it on here. I, I you know, I think you should. <laughs> not no pressure. I know how busy you are, but yeah, I, I, <laughs> I'd love to, to you know to see that. That that would be. I think it'd be great. Uh, that, would, that would be incredible. I was I was listening to um, a podcast actually. It was about Elon Musk. Oh, he's brilliant as well. Yeah, he's, he's, his book's great as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I've listened to. I tried reading that and then ended up putting on uh, Audible. Uh, and he's kind of recently mentioned about his neurodiversity. Uh, That's right. Yeah. The rang is kind of, um, and whether this is true or not, I don't know. But it's his kind of timekeeping and how he kind of works, you know, with SpaceX and Tesla and how he breaks his day up. And and it was just really interesting. You, you know, you think about this man who's just so busy and uh, you know works mm. incredible hours. And uh, it was down to his, his, his emails as well. Apparently, he has a certain a lot of time he looks at emails, but he's quite, kind of got them encoded. Apparently, uh, again, this is just what I've listened. So he's got a, a certain encrypted email, so only certain emails can come through. So it doesn't waste his time having yeah. nonsense uh, uh, emails coming through. So you know, and then it's kind of how he breaks his day up, how he does this, how he. It's just yeah, it's just it's it's pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty intense. Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I wouldn't want to work. I don't know if I could work. Yeah. So that kind of pattern. No, absolutely. Yeah, I totally get it. There's, there's loads of things you can do. Um, so there's a, somebody, one of my colleagues from years ago on Outlook, there's a stupid setting you can change, which makes that conversation instead of individual emails. I don't know if you've ever seen that. I, um, I flick through a, this. I don't know what I'm doing when I flick through it, but I actually look. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do that, then it takes all, I'm really, because I spend hours away from my computer and you come back to it any email that's been sent on the same chain is all looks like one email and then you can open it and you can see everything that's going on. But it means you end up with one looks like one email and that's the whole conversation rather than having them sort of stagger yeah. through your inbox. Yeah, uh, It's good. It's just, there's loads of little things like that. But like, um, yeah, it's, I think we need to read a dyslexic help book for the world. But no, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have the contacts. You, 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 you sort it out. You, you can speak to, uh, <laughs> Uh, made, yeah. made by, uh, made by um, like you as well. Kate, Kate will help, I'm sure. I just want to share, um, uh, Roxana, um, as put, uh, this, sounds fab this sounds fabulous, but with ADD in the mix, it's a challenge, but we'll, uh, we'll explore the bullet journal idea. It sounds like something that would really work uh, for me. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, uh, I, I love um, taking notes. Uh, you know, I take notes all the time because I feel like I've got a short-term memory and, I come up with all these different ideas and then suddenly they kind of drop off and yeah. I'm like, you know what was that and I've, I've recently um uh, someone uh, commented on my one of my LinkedIn posts and they mentioned about when you go for a walk um you know turn the phone off uh, you know walk in nature to relax and stuff to get a bit of downtime but maybe try and record your thoughts as well because I tend to you know when I like in the shower or going for a walk or something I tend to come up with all these kind of creative ideas and then I come back uh and, and think oh, you know what was it so and i always yeah, remember yeah. you know richard branson says he you know he swears by walking um everywhere he goes he has a book um that he can kind of just jot his ideas and i think he yeah. shares a lot of it on his uh on his social channels you know oh, some of the huge, notes he scribbled huge right even for, for everybody you know not just not just people with neurodiversity stuff you know and taking notes or keeping notes of, of what's going on in your head helps massively even if you never read it again just to get it out yeah. of your head on a bit of paper can, can give you a lot of clarity. 
And I think that's one of the things I, I liked about the um I'm I'm really busy. We're a small company, it's a, very much a startup. So I've got a lot going on. And I find it therapeutic to put it all into <laughs> into this bullet journal and prioritize it in my own head. And the priorities change, that's fine. That's okay. Yeah. But priorities changing is still a lot less stressful than trying to remember everything that's going on. You just put it all in this book and go through. I think yeah, that's great. But yeah, I think there's this there's loads and loads there different people do to, to try and get through it. But no, it's great. There's loads of different options. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Aaron. It's definitely, like I said, you know, recording and documenting is that's definitely something that I've uh, found that really helps. Sometimes I, I wish uh, I did it more. How do you find um, kind of uh, relaxing um, in the sense of, you know, zoning out? Is it is it walking? Is it listening to the audio books? Because, again, you know, you, you're obviously very busy. And obviously, I guess your mind's always racing in the sense of what, you know, because you're a very yeah. person. <laughs> find ways to, to kind of relax and I've got, I've got, uh, yeah, I've also got three kids. Um, <laughs> okay, scrap a, that question. <laughs> yeah, so I don't relax. No, so I've got a, a brilliant wife, and I've got uh, three three kids. Uh, so Olive's two, a way to be two. Eric's uh, a way to be five, and uh, Nina's way to be seven. So they're all um, they're all pretty close. But yeah, so when I'm we're not with them i think what i i do uh, sort of decompress is listen to audiobooks when i'm sort of um going around uh, doing the house you know, we're coughing, you know, going around the house and do dishwasher and stuff yeah, i've got these, yeah. these massive headphones you know like <laughs> all the sounds gone big headphones on and uh listen to audiobooks and i think it's great and i think if you can find something you're interested in i listen to, i pretty much don't listen to any fiction and uh my wife always says oh, you should listen to some fiction stuff and i was like yeah but I feel like I'm, I think sort of the last few years, I feel, I've had this thing in my head where I, I feel like I've missed out on a lot of education because I never did any real further education. Yeah, yeah, so I feel yeah. like if you can absorb all these books, you actually you learn a lot through just listening. And I, I've always found that I'm very much an audible learner. Yeah. So, I mean, my wife always says it's amazing when watching movies or talking about a film, I can remember whole scenes of dialogue in my head without trying. It just sort of comes out. Um, but audio books are the same. You know, um, Charlotte's sick of it of me telling her, "Oh, yeah, she's in this. This is amazing." Did you, did you know that Arnold Schwarzenegger drinks ten eggs in the morning? You know that kind of thing. It's like you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, facts. Yeah, that, that, that just all these kind of things stick, stick in your head. But the, um, I think if you can if you can find anything that helps you sort of decompress, then it helps. And I think it's it's essential as well. I, did, I started um, road cycling when over lockdown, but I've sort of fallen off the wagon because I hurt my foot. But I need to get back to that because that was good as well because you were just out doing nothing else. I think that's 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 important too. Yeah. But if, and actually enjoying your work, I think is huge. I always thought I enjoyed my work. I always thought I was like, no, oh, no, I I quite like what I do. I like engineering. And then it wasn't until I started here, and I was like, oh, I actually love what I do here. And I think there's a big difference. You can like being an engineer or like being a technician or like whatever you're doing, but if you don't actually love your work, or you know, those the vast majority of people go through life and not loving their work, but if you do love your work it's not a chore come to work. Like yeah. I genuinely enjoy what I do, like to my very core, love the robots. I think it's amazing. Whole, I can't talk too much about it, but the whole premise of the whole thing is, is awesome. Yeah. And it's just engineering awesomeness and we build really cool <laughs> stuff and it's, and the team's great. And it's it just, it's, it's really good. I, lo I love the whole thing and the owners are brilliant. And, um, you know, so I, I mentioned them shortly after I started, it's like, oh, not sure if it's a thing. Just, you know, I'm dyslexic. And they were just like, uh huh, and like couldn't care any less. It's like yeah. we hired you because you're you, and if being dyslexic is part of that, then that's great. It's like cool, that's cool, good to know. But I think it doesn't matter what you're doing, if it's accounting or admin assisting or being a doctor, whatever. If you actually love your job, everything's easier. It's also easier to focus, way easier to focus. If you're in a job you didn't, the one my one of the jobs I really disliked when I was at Acker, I was what you'd call like a proper work package engineer. So you sat at your desk and you churned out the like going through data sheets and all that stuff. I hated it. Yeah. Absolutely hated it. And I found that really hard to focus. And that was probably the toughest job I think I've ever had. And it wasn't because the job was hard. It was just because I found it hard to stay focused on it. That was probably the most sort of dyslexia affected job I had. And I went from that to being a project engineer, which was great because I just talked to people and made sure people were doing their job. That was way easier. So I just went right back into my element. But yeah, proper work package engineering, I found really tough to focus on. Because I think if you don't, if you don't love what you're doing, it's, it's nigh on impossible. For anybody, but you know, I think probably even worse for dyslexic. I, 
I think you, you're you're a very sociable person as well. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. Sociable and, and community. I remember one of my um, so I, I need to kind of be in you know a social environment. I, I thrive when I'm in a social environment. And I remember one of the you know I've had many 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 different jobs over the years, and I actually worked um, for Virgin Megastore. Um, oh, cool. With the CD. This was um, you know the CD DVD store when it was uh, when it was about. I remember applying for this because I loved movies. I loved, you know, the whole kind of thing. And um, I left school with no qualifications. And and in the interview, I was, uh, you know, talking and everything. They said, oh, um, we, we, you know, I thought I was just be on the floor, you know, kind of moving the DVDs around and all this thing. And they said, oh, we're going to put you in the cash office. And I, I said, oh, OK, you know, what's that? Uh, and then and I just remember being in the cash office. Uh, I learned so much. But it was very it was it, it was literally um you know, a, a, as you know, cash offices in in, in stores, yeah. a tiny little kind of box. Uh, it was me and this this other uh, lady who was, you know, incredible what she done. But as soon and then it kind of the pods come up, you count the cash and you put it out. And yeah. I always remember uh, the the audit run of if there was kind of you know fifty p missing or you know discrepancy, not missing, but you know discrepancy and thing. I just remember going through this till roll, this great big thick till roll, looking for this discrepancy against something yeah. else. Day oh, in, day awful. Day. And I was oh. thinking, this is just not <laughs> like this was undiagnosed dyslexia. So at the time, I was thinking, this is uh, it's making my head like explode. Yeah, yeah. Like, hours of just going, you know, cross channeling these two till rolls, yeah. trying to find the discrepancy. I, I found it, and I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay, there's another eleven there to go through. <laughs> I was like, oh. So, uh, oh, that sent my worst nightmare. That's <laughs> awful. It's absolutely awful. So if I yeah. ever do meet Richard Branson, I'll just say, you know, I didn't, I didn't enjoy it too much in the cash office, but it was great work. Yeah, just let me know. Let me know. I want to chat as well. That'd be great. <laughs> all right, we're we're coming up to the the end of the time. I could talk to you all day, my friend. Um, <laughs> and I really do appreciate, uh, you know, like I said, Chris. So if people want to um, connect with you and get in contact with you, how how can they do that? Yeah, I just uh, LinkedIn is probably the best. You know, I, I still I still um, really enjoy LinkedIn. I think it's a great a great means of keeping in contact with people, especially sort of like minded people. But no, yeah, if anybody wants to chat about anything, uh, especially dyslexia, that's what I know about. Um, then yes, yeah, let us know. I'm sure I've been tagged in some of this stuff. I'm sure you'll find it. But yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah definitely. And 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 it, I, you know, I shared um, your your blog out, and if you're happy for for me to share that out again, yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. You know, people and, and and as I met, I think I mentioned this kind of you know to you before but it is it's incredible when we're able to kind of open up and share our kind of experiences uh it really does help people um you know to start kind of connecting um yeah. and like we said you know you get kind of private messages i get kind of private messages and obviously we won't mention names and, and and things but it's just it's amazing to hear other people's um journey and story and and if you can mm -hmm. make that small little bit of difference then it's uh then it's all oh, absolutely i know no, definitely and i know it's been great to be on thanks for having me and uh, if yeah if you ever want to have another chat let us know i've got loads definitely. of <laughs> um, no i really do appreciate you definitely be ha uh, having you back and thank you so much indeed for your time enjoy the enjoy the rest of your uh, your friday have an amazing weekend and yeah, i'll you catch too. you very very soon my friend great Take right. care. thank Cheers. you very much Cheers. see you later So guys, that was Aaron. I hope you enjoyed that just as much as I did. He's an incredible chap doing very modest as well, but he's doing incredible things for dyslexia, uh, neurodiversity. And also, uh, I'm really, I would love to know a little bit more about the robots, but obviously we can't <laughs> because of obviously all the secrecy uh, behind it, but he's doing an incredible, incredible job. So please do uh, connect with him. I'm um, definitely going to be trying that bullet idea with the, uh, with, um, with, with the notes and everything else thank you as always for uh for tuning in and watching we will be back next friday with uh, another uh, amazing guest have an amazing weekend and i will see you soon take care guys cheers bye-bye